Hello everyone and welcome to chapter 13 in your practical introduction to management course. This week we will be going over chapter 13 which is over groups and teams. Now this chapter will consider the groups versus teams and discuss different kinds of teams. The chapter will also describe how groups evolve into teams as well as discuss how managers can build effective teams. The chapter will finally consider the nature of conflict, both good and bad conflict. Let's go ahead and look at our objectives now. First objective in the chapter is the section called Groups versus Teams. Now, after reading this section, you should be able to answer this question. How is one collection of workers different from any other? Part two of our chapter is over stages of group and team development. After reading this part of the chapter, you should be able to answer the major question of how does a group evolve into a team? The next part of the chapter is the third part, which will be building effective teams. After reading this part and looking at all the concepts, you should be able to answer the question, how can I, as a manager, build an effective team? And lastly, the chapter ends with managing conflict. After reading this part of the chapter, finishing chapter 13, you should be able to answer the question, since conflict is a part of life, what should a manager know about it in order to deal successfully with it? All right, let's go ahead and jump into our first part of the chapter here. Okay, let's first talk about group versus teams. Now, organizations are not only flatter and information-based, but also organized around teamwork. Teamwork is now the cornerstone of progressive management for a number of reasons. As you can see here in Table 13.1, some of those reasons increase productivity, use teamwork for increased speed, reduce cost, improve quality. It's also important for reduced destructive internal competition amongst workers and an improved workplace cohesiveness. Now, a group of people and a team of people are not the same thing. A group is defined as two or more freely interacting individuals who share collective norms and goals and have a common identity. It is different from a crowd, which is a transitory collection of people who don't interact with one another. It's also different from an organization, such as maybe a labor union, which is, also, which is so large that members also don't really interact. Now a team on the other hand is a small group of people with complementary skills who are committed to a common purpose, performance goals, and approach for which they hold themselves mutually accountable. Now if we go back to groups here, groups may be of two different types. They may be formal or informal. A formal group is a group established to do something productive for the organization and is headed by a leader. A formal group may be a division, a department, a work group, or a committee, and it may be either permanent or it may be a temporary group. People are usually assigned to teams according to their skills and the organization's requirements. Now the other type of group, the informal group, is a group informed by people seeking friendship and has no official appointed leader, although a leader may emerge from the membership. An informal group may simply be a collection of friends or other voluntary organization. Informal groups can advance or undercut the plans of formal groups. These groups can also be highly productive, even more so than formalized groups. Now we'll jump back into teams, which we defined earlier as a small group of people with the complementary skills who are committed to a common purpose, maybe performance goals, and an approach for which they hold themselves mutually accountable. Now, as you can see here in Table 13.2, we have several different various types of teams. Continuous improvement, cross-functional teams, these are definitely seen in many organizations. This is where members compose of people from different departments, such as, you know, let's say human resources and production, as well as you could have, you know, several different groups involved. Uh, material handling, let's say shipping, everybody coming together for a purpose of a common objective. Let's let's say it's to increase the efficiency of the production line. So all these groups that have an outside view might come together, take a look at the problem, see if they can't come up with a solution so that there are just people of different departments that might have different in, invest into these this procedure can have different perspectives that can all come to accomplish that common goal. We have self-managed teams, top management teams, virtual teams, and work teams. Now work teams for engage in a collective work requiring a coordinated effort. Uh, they are of four types. 
identified according to their basic purpose, such as advice, production, project, or action. Advice teams are created to broaden the informal base for managerial decisions, and examples such as committees, adva advisory councils, and continuous improvement teams. Product yeah, production teams are responsible for performing the day-to-day -day operations, such as maybe a flight attendant crew or maintenance crew for working on highways. Project teams work do creative problem solving, often by applying the specialized knowledge of members of a cross-functional team. I talked a little bit about a cross-functional team earlier. It's just staffed with specialists pursuing a common objective. Um, you can, you've probably seen some of these in different works, or you will in the future, uh, that they call task force, or maybe you've worked with an engineering team or a development team. These are just examples of those cross-functional teams. And then lastly, action teams work to accomplish tasks that require people with specialized training and a high degree of coordination. An example would be like a hospital surgery team or an airline cockpit crew. If you look up here on our table, you see self-managed teams. Now, self-managed teams emerge from what we called quality circles. These are now known as continuous improvement teams, and if you've ever worked in manufacturing, you'll always hear about continuous improvement. So in a, a continuous improvement team, which consists of a small group of volunteers or workers and supervisors who meet intermittently to discuss workplace and quality related items. Now a self-managed team are defined as a group of workers who are given administrative oversight of their task domains. Now administrative oversight involves delegated activities such as planning, scheduling, monitoring, and staffing. The traditional distinction between manager and managed is being blurred as non-managerial employees are delegated greater authority and granted an increased authority. The most common chore of today's self-management teams are work scheduling and customer interaction. Least common are, of course, hiring and firing of employees. Self-managed teams have been found to have a positive effect on productivity and attitudes of self-responsibility and control, but there is no significant effect on job satisfaction or organizational commitment that's been measured. All right, let's look at table 13.3 here. This, just, this table shows some ways to empower self-managed teams, and you can read through those that managers should make teams more accountable for their work and allow them to set their own team goals and let them solve their own work problems. That way they are just working cohesively together as well they should without being dictated or micromanaged. The team should also work with a whole product or service, not just a single part. Assign jobs and tasks to the members and develop its own quality standards and measurement techniques and handle their own problems with internal as well as external customers. The sense of empowerment uh, can really help the self-managed team be more effective. And you see number three here is team members are cross-trained on jobs within their and other teams. Do their own hiring, training, firing. This is an area that um, we know in theory looks great here, but you still have to worry about the legality issues and stuff like that unless you have you know HR members as part of those self-managed teams. And let them do their own evaluations of each other at the end um, to see how the projects go. Lastly, the team has access to important information resources inside and outside the organization. They should be allowed to communicate with and draw support from other teams and departments and set their own rules and policies. This is great as another tool for empowering your self-managed teams. Now we'll look at part two of chapter 13. This is over stages of group and team development. Now groups and teams go through five stages of development. You can see those here in figure 13. Point one, those are forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjoining. Now the first stage is forming, and this is the process of getting oriented and getting acquainted. This stage is characterized by a high degree of uncertainty as members try to break the ice and figure out who's in charge and what the group's goals are. Mutual trust is low in forming, and there is a good deal of holding back to see who takes charge and how they take charge. Leaders should allow time for people to become acquainted and socialize during this first stage, the forming stage. Now, as we move to the second stage here of our group and team development, this is called storming. This is characterized by the emergence of individual personalities and roles and conflicts within that group or team. The length of this stage depends on the clarity of goals and the commitment and maturity of all of the team members. 
Individuals may test the leader's policies to determine how they fit into the power structure. And in this stage, the leader should encourage members to suggest ideas, voice any type of disagreements they have, and work through any and all of their conflicts. Now we move into the third stage, which is once again called the norming. And this is where conflicts are resolved. Close relationships develop and unity and harmony should emerge. The group may now evolve into a functioning team. Teams set guidelines for what its members will do together and how they will do it. Questions about authority are resolved through unemotional group discussion. Group cohesiveness, a kind of we feeling binding group members together, is the principal byproduct of stage three. The leader here should emphasize unity and help identify the team's goals and their values during stage three. Now when we look at stage four, which is performing, in the fourth stage, members concentrate on solving problems and completing the assigned tasks. During this stage, leaders should give members the empowerment they need to work on completing those tasks. And lastly, let's move to the final stage here, adjourning. And the final stage here, members prepare for disbandonment. The leader can help ease the transition by ritual celebrating the end and new beginnings. The team leader can highlight valuable lessons learned to prepare everyone for future group and team efforts as they move forward and out of this group. Okay, now let's move into the third part of the chapter. This is over building effective teams. Now, the most essential considerations in building an effective team are cooperation, trust, and cohesiveness. These are followed by performance goals and feedback, motivation through mutual accountability, size, roles, norms, and awareness of groupthink. Cooperation, this is where individuals are said to be cooperating when their efforts are systematically integrated to achieve a collective objective. A meta-analysis of studies suggests that cooperation is superior to competition and individualistic efforts in promoting achievement and productivity. Trust is defined as the reciprocal faith in others' intentions and behaviors. The word reciprocal emphasizes the kind of the give and take aspect of trust. Trust begets trust, distrust begets distrust. Trust is based on credibility, how believable you are based on your past acts of integrity and follow through on your promises. And lastly, cohesiveness is the tendency of a group or team to stick together. Managers can simulate cohesiveness by encouraging people to have face-to-face -face exchanges at work. Now, a recent study found that patterns of communication among team members were the most important predictor of team success. Now, table 13.5 here, as you can see, shows other suggestions for enhancing team cohesiveness, such as keep the team small so that there's not, they're not too large to get out of hand and not be able to manage as well. Encourage members interaction and cooperation, which we talked about previously. Uh, such things as give each team, mem team member a stake in the team success, kind of a piece of the action so that they feel like they are definitely part of that team. Uh, direct each member's special talents towards the common goals. And obviously one of the most important ones is to definitely recognize each team member's contributions. And I talked a little bit about keeping your team small. Uh, small and large teams have different characteristics, although the number of members is somewhat arbitrary. Uh, teams with nine or fewer members have advantages and disadvantages. Advantages, there's better interaction, you know, more opportunity for personal discussion and participation. There's better morale. Uh, members are able to better see the worth of their individual con contributions. And the disadvantages, there are fewer resources, you know, there's less knowledge, experience, skills, and abilities to apply to the team tasks. And another disadvantage would be that they're, you know, possibly less innovation. A group that's too small may be less creative and bold. Now, large teams of 10 to 16 members have different advantages and disadvantages as well. An advantage of those larger teams is there's more resources. They can access more knowledge, experience, skills, abilities, and time. There's also a advantage of division of labor. Large teams can take advantage of division of labor in which the work is divided into particular tasks that are assigned to particular workers. The disadvantages of those large teams are that there's less interaction, there's less sharing of information and coordinating of activities, it could possibly be lower morale as people are less able to see the worth of their individual contributions, 
And there can be a tendency for some social loafing, which is the tendency of people to exert less effort when working in groups rather than when they're working alone. Now let's define a couple of key terms here when it comes to uh, building effective teams. We have the terms roles and norms. And a role is a socially determined expectation of how an individual should behave in a specific position. A team member's role is to help the team reach its goals. Members develop their roles based on the expectations of the team, the organization, and themselves. Now, there are two types of team roles, task and maintenance. A task role, or you could call this a task-oriented role, consists of behavior that concentrates on getting the team's tasks done. These roles keep the team on track and get the work done. A maintenance role, or a relationship-oriented role, consists of behavior and fosters constructive relationships among its members. These roles focus on keeping the team members together. Now if we look at norms, which are general guidelines or rules of behavior that most group or team members follow. You can kind of call these the unwritten rules for team members. Uh, norms define the boundaries between acceptable and unacceptable behavior. Although unwritten, norms have a powerful influence on the group and overall organizational behavior. Now, norms are forced into four primary reasons, or they're enforced for four primary reasons. To help the group survive. Kind of don't do anything that will hurt us type attitude. Another primary reason for norms being enforced is to clarify role expectations. Next reason is to help individuals avoid embarrassing situations. Kind of, hey, don't call attention to yourself. And norms are also enforced for the reason to emphasize the group's important values and identity. Now the last consideration for that must be taken into account for building a group into an effective team is that they must be aware of groupthink. Now groupthink is a cohesive group's blind unwillingness to consider alternatives. The group striving for unanimity overrides their motivation to realistic appraise alternatives courses of action. And in the chapter we also talked about the Abilene Paradox, which is the tendency of people to go along with others for the sake of avoiding conflict. Uh, we have different symptoms of recognizing groupthink, and those different symptoms include invulnerability, inherent morality, and stereotyping of opposition. Crew members have the illusion that nothing can go wrong, breeding excessive optimism and risk-taking. Because they are so assured of the rightness of their actions, they ignore the ethical implications of their decisions, and these beliefs are helped along by stereotyped views of the opposition. The next symptom you can see here is rationalization and self-censorship. Rationalizing protects the pet assumptions underlying the group's decision from critical questions. And self-censorship also stifles critical debate. The next one here is the illusion of unanimity, peer pressure, and mind guards. Silence by a member is the interpreted to mean consent. But if people do disagree, peer pressure leads other members to question the loyalty of the dissenters. There may also be people known as mind guards, self-appointed protectors against adverse information. And lastly, groupthink versus wisdom of the crowds. Groupthink is characterized by pressure to conform that often leads to members with different ideas to censor themselves, the opposite of collective wisdom. Now, among different uh, decision-making effects that can arise from groupthink are a reduction in alternative ideas. Uh, decisions are made based on just a few alternatives, and uh, neither preferred alternatives nor reject alternatives are gone back and re-examined. Another one is that there's a limiting of other information. When a groupthink group has made its decision, other opinions are rejected. There are no contingency plans in case the decision turns out to be faulty. Now, in preventing groupthink, um, you know, allow criticism. Each member should be encouraged to be a critical evaluator. Allow other perspectives. Outside experts should be used to introduce fresh perspectives. When alternatives are discussed, someone should be made devil's advocate to try to turn all negative factors. 
Okay, now let's take a look at the last part of chapter 13. And this is over managing conflict. Among the sources of workplace conflict are employee dismissals, increased workload, pressure cooker deadlines, and demands for higher productivity. As we see here, the definition of conflict is a process in which one party perceives that its interests are being opposed or negatively affected by another party. Conflict may be between individuals, between an individual and a group, between groups, and between an organization and its environment. There are two types of conflicts, dysfunctional conflict and functional conflict. Here's, you can see the definition of these two here. And sometimes this dysfunctional conflict is called negative conflict. And this is just where conflict is hinders the organization's performance or threatens its interests. Now, as a manager, you need to know what to do, um, what you can do to remove dysfunctional conflict. Sometimes, once again, this is called negative conflict. Functional conflict, which is also called constructive conflict or sometimes even cooperative conflict, benefits the main purpose of the organization and serves its interests. Now you can see here in figure 13.2 we have a relationship between level of conflict and a level of performance. Now can too little or too much conflict affect performance? Now, social scientists now believe that the organization can suffer from too little conflict. Too little conflict is called indolence. And this work groups or organizations that experience too little conflict tend to suffer apathy or lack of creativity. And you can see that based on our chart here that if we have low conflict, we can also have low performance. Now, too much conflict, we call this warfare. Excessive conflict can erode organizational performance. Too much conflict can show up as workplace aggression and violence. So a moderate level of conflict can raise performance by increasing or encouraging creativity. So you can see we, ha we there is an optimal level of conflict that affects performance in a positive way. Now there are three kinds of conflict. There's personality, intergroup, and cross-cultural. And there are a variety of sources of conflict, uh, so-called conflict triggers. Now personality conflict is defined as an interpersonal opposition based on personal dislike, due to disagreement, or different styles. Personality clashes when an individual differences can't be resolved. Uh, there can also be time pressure when people believe that there aren't enough hours to do the work or communication failures when people misperceive and misunderstand. Another type of conflict are the intergroup conflicts and this is clashes between work groups, teams, and departments. Some causes of intergroup conflicts can be things such as inconsistent goals or reward systems, ambiguous jurisdictions, this is where no job boundaries are, are clear, uh, perhaps status differences when there are inconsistencies in the power and influence. And there's also multicultural conflicts. This is kind of clashes between cultures. With cross-border mer mergers, joint ventures, and international alliances common, there are frequent opportunities for clashes between the different cultures during those joint ventures and mergers and such. Well, everyone, that's it for Chapter 13 over Groups and Teams, where we started with talking about the difference between groups and teams, the different stages of building a team, how to build an effective team, and then once you have that team, how to manage conflict. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the content, as well as the content that's in the chapter, and we'll see you in the next, in the next one coming up, Chapter 14. Thanks, everyone.